Before I decided to pursue my career as a full-time artist, I served 18 years as a Toronto police officer. And you want to know what the scariest thing I ever did in 18 years on the police force? No, none of that stuff. It was quitting my job and walking away from my pension to try to make a living as a full-time artist. So look, if you're trying to make a living as an artist right now, or you're doing another job and you're hoping at some point to make that break, to make your art full-time, I know how scary it can be. I know just how you feel. And I also know what you need to do to be successful. It was even scarier for me because I had two young boys at the time who were in junior kindergarten and grade one. But fast forward to now, I've made several million dollars from the sale of my art. I'm living the life of my dreams. And actually, one of my sons, Cameron, actually works for me full time and makes a very good living doing that. Now, in this video, I'm going to show you how I was able to go from someone who just painted as a hobby to become an extremely successful artist. But I guess the big question for you is why should you listen to me? Right. What do I know? How do you know I know what I'm talking about? Well, I hate doing this stuff, but I've recently become a big fan of Alex Hermosi. And he says, before people will listen to you, they need to know what you've done so they know that you actually have some credibility. So here it is. As I mentioned, since I left the police force, I've made several million dollars from the sale of my art. I've been extremely successful in self-publishing my work. We probably made close to a million dollars in selling prints. Now we do all of the publishing ourselves as well. We take the photos, we do the printing, we ship the work. I've been the top selling artist in a number of commercial galleries. I've also been the top selling artist at a number of art festivals. I've been featured on national television, on one of Canada's morning shows on global TV with my work. I've gone viral on LinkedIn and actually had my LinkedIn membership suspended because I had such huge reach with my posts. In 2017, I mentored a young artist by the name of Brooke Cormier. You should check her out now. She's got over a quarter million followers on Instagram now, and she's living the life of her dreams. And her work sells for more than mine now. Now, 2019, I had some really serious health problems that led to an epiphany for me, and I decided it wasn't enough for me just to keep making more money off my art. I wanted to share everything I'd learned with other aspiring artists so that those who share that same dream know that it is possible and I can actually show them the way to make their living from their art, to get to go into their studio every day, do what they love, and have the world give you a good living for that. Now, I've also received some critical acclaim for my work. I was elected as a senior signature member of the Canadian Institute of Portrait Artists. I was also elected as a member of the Canadian Society of Painters and Watercolor. I served on the board of that for 10 years, including two years as president. Oh, and this year, I'm going to be doing a watercolor that's going to be going into the collection of Prince Charles. Well, I should say King Charles, because he is an informal patron of our society. And this year, he's accepting a book from former presidents of the society where we each will have one original watercolor in there. Oh, and since starting my art academy, I've had a number of students go on to incredible success. We've got Emily Valentine, who experienced three sellout shows in a row uh, and quadrupled the price of her work in one summer. Emma Hainstock had 7,000 in sales in her first show and by the end of the summer did over 24,000 in sales. Monica Marquez Gattaca, she just emailed me at, at the end of last year to let me know she did over 45,000 in sales. Ross Wheeler, who's a teacher, who's been teaching all of my stuff to his students, decided to enter a jury show for the first time in his life, and he won first prize in painting. And Amy Adams, another one of my students, she was just recently mentioned in the Artist Magazine competition as an artist to watch, and she got an honorable mention in their open competition in the painting category. So all that to say, I know a lot about the business of being an artist, and I've been very successful in all aspects of it. And I know how you can do it too. I'm not special. There's nothing special about me. I was not gifted. But by associating with a lot of successful artists, I looked at what they did. I picked their brains and I did that. And that has led to my success. And now my mission in life is to share that with as many people as possible. 
Oh, and the whole art academy thing too. Have I been successful at that? Well, we're actually approaching half a million dollars in sales and we're going to hit that by the end of the year. So I've also been very successful at that too. Now, I hate kind of talking about all this stuff because it sounds so braggy and I know some of you are going to be turned off by it. But some of you hopefully are going to realize that, listen, if you're going to listen to the advice of someone, maybe it should be someone who's been there and done that. So let's go forward. In this video, I'm going to show you how I went from being a watercolor painter who painted portraits to developing my own unique voice, which has led to my ultimate success. And I'm going to give you some keys and some of the things that you can do on the journey to finding your own unique voice. Now, if you've never seen my content before, I've been publishing free stuff on YouTube for artists for probably close to a decade. And there's a couple hundred YouTube videos up there. But I also have some online courses that are more structured. And so if that's something you might want to investigate and even the opportunity down the road to work with me with weekly calls, with critiques and advice and that kind of thing, well, you can click on the link in the description. That'll take you to a page where you can watch a video about my Unstoppable Artist program. Okay, let's get into how I was able to go from some dumb copper who just liked to paint to achieving everything that I just told you about. Well, there were a couple of keys that were absolutely essential. Now, one of them was reaching the realization that just producing good art wasn't going to be enough. To make a decent living from your art, I realized I had to produce great art, but not only great art, but great art with a unique voice. But I also had to understand something about the art world, right? And that, that the village of commercial sales is a very different village than the village of postmodernism with like the meat dress and three blank canvases and exhibitions of invisible work. Um, and that the definition of great art in the world of commercial sales is simple and it's actually defined by the public. And it's to create work that stops people in their tracks and takes their breath away, to create work that exhibits mastery of all of the skills and concepts that have been valued in art since the Enlightenment. And you had to do that in a way that your work was unique, that people recognized your work. As soon as they saw it, they know who did it. Because if you can do that, you don't have any competition. If you're just producing good work out there, then the public is going to choose from the thousands of other artists out there that are producing good work. Um, and even if you're producing great work, if there's nothing distinctive about it, they'll just look for other artists who are producing great work and they'll go to the cheapest one. So it's absolutely essential. You need to produce great art and you need to do it with a unique voice. Now, at the time I left the police force, I was a fairly high realism portrait painter in watercolors and oils. I very quickly got tired of painting paintings of other people's people the way they wanted me to paint them and decided I was going to move into landscape. I had no idea how to do that. And I actually sucked at landscape painting at that time. And this is where another one of those keys came in. I was exposed for the first time to the idea of the three different modes of painting, and that's product, practice, and process. I'd never heard of these before. This was actually told to me by Ed Shawcross, uh, former president of the Canadian Watercolor Society. And once I put these three different modes of painting to work, that is where my work really started to take off. And I was able to use these three modes to go from my watercolor portrait work to develop the voice that I've been known for now that has garnered me such huge success. Now, the rest of this video is actually a module from my Creating Your Plan for Success, which is part of my um, Unstoppable Artist program. But in this module, I actually show you the steps that I took, how I went from work like this to ultimately achieving work like this, and the steps that you need to take if you want to find your own ultimate unique voice. And as I said, if you can create great work with a unique voice, making a living as an artist is actually relatively easy until or unless you can create great work with a unique voice. It is virtually impossible. Okay, so let's go to the module. Okay, in this module, I'm going to dig a little deeper on the whole idea of practice, product, and process, in particular spending time on process and showing you what that looked like for me, how I went from a high realism portrait painter to where I am now, but all of the various stages in between. Practice, I'm just going to skip over this, but yeah, things that we would count as practice is like, is like uh, keeping a daily sketchbook, going to life drawing classes. When you're doing value sketches, 
brushes before doing a painting, um, or when you're just using scratch paper or canvas, uh, the canvas paper, and you're practicing techniques. The whole idea here is there's no ex expectation of any sort of finished product to come out of this, no sellable product. The only purpose is to improve your skills um, and concepts until you become very competent on things. This is where you should be spending a lot of time. So if you are not very competent at your drawing skills, this is where you should be spending most of your time is practicing drawing until you get better. Product. Um, the And the ultimate example for me would have been commissioned portraits. So these were all commissioned portraits that I did. Um, and so that's where there is an, a huge expectation that at the end of the painting process, you are going to have a finished sellable product that the client is going to buy. And in this case, it's actually for a specific client who's commissioned me to paint, um, in this case, their kids, all of these. So when you're in product mode, you're just utilizing the skills, the concepts, the media, and subject matter that you are competent and confident in. There's a high expectation of success. The problem is if you just stay in product mode, there's no improvement or growth. 10 years from now, you won't be any better or be painting any different than you are um, right now. And again, the purpose here is to create sellable paintings. Um, and this is the mode you're on when you're trying to maximize your sales right now, trying to make the best painting you can make right now for sale. And then we get into process mode. One of my favorite modes of painting, one of the most important modes of painting, and one of the things that most artists don't understand um, and don't utilize. So let's look at what defines process, right? We're trying new things, whether that be skills, techniques, media, subject matter, concepts, stylistic approach. And when you're in process mode, the very first thing you do is you give yourself in the painting permission to fail. Because you're doing stuff that you don't know how to do that you've never done before, there's a good chance the painting's not going to turn out to be great. Uh, and it may, in fact, be a dog's breakfast, and that's okay. So no expectation of a finished product. The purpose here is to learn. It's learning new skills, learning how much you like painting a certain thing. It's just trying new things and learning. Now, the good news here is this also may result in a sellable painting. In particular, if you're at the stage where you've mastered drawing, you've mastered painting techniques, and you've mastered composition, then quite likely every painting that you do here, or I shouldn't say every painting, most of them may in fact turn out to be sellable. They just mostly are not going to be the thing that you end up focusing on that becomes your voice. You can still sell um, paintings that you do in here. And the great thing about process mode is that's where breakthroughs occur. That's where you create something. You have that aha moment. The clouds open up, the sun shines down, and the public just goes crazy over it. Um, that only happens in process mode. And this is something that you need to focus on to maximize your long-term sales of where you're going to be in the future. And I'll deal with that kind of a little later about how that really ties into this. Um, but as I said, if your skills and conceptual knowledge are high, you're probably also going to result in a lot of sellable paintings. Now, as I'm going through and I show you, so these are all paintings that I did when I was trying to make the transition. Um, I knew I wanted to paint in landscape and I wanted to paint on canvas. That's where I was focusing. So these were all examples of pieces that I did in that process mode. And these all did in fact sell. I think pretty much every painting I'm going to show you in this presentation has sold. Um, and again, that's why it's important to master the skills um, and composition and the painting techniques um, before you spend a lot of time here. Otherwise, you could just produce very different work, but all of it not very good. I love this quote from Frank Webb, a famous watercolor painter and teacher of the 20th century. And this is to deal with the whole idea of process, right? We start out digging little holes all over the backyard, but at a certain point, you got to pick a spot and dig deep. Um, and this is what you will do throughout your career. Um, but when you pick a spot to dig deep, you're not planting a flag and saying, I'm going to die on this hill and this is me for the rest of my life. It's not a forever commitment. Although it might be. So what you do, again, we're in process, we're trying all kinds of different things, and maybe all of one, one painting, one painting that you do in that process, you go, wow, I really kind of like that, and the public kind of likes it, 
Um, and I really enjoyed the process. So then it's like, okay, I'm going to dig deep here. Um, and then what, what you have to gauge is, does that result in something where you love the process, you love the work, and where the public loves the work too, where their demand becomes overwhelming. Um, and if that happens, then that might in fact be someplace you're going to dig deep for a while or maybe forever. But if it doesn't happen, then it's back to digging little holes all over the backyard until something else kind of stands out at you. It's like, oh, I'm going to dig deep here. Um, and also when you're in this this um, mode, we, we are sometimes flitting back and forth through process and product mode. So it's like, say you've, again, you've, you've done three or four or five paintings, all very different, very different techniques, very different approaches. Then you go, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to try and do a painting, combining all of these things and try and make the best painting I can with this stuff. And so then you're kind of, this is the only time where you're mixing process and product, but you still know that, okay, there's a good chance the painting might not turn out, but you are trying to create a great painting based on the things that you've already learned. Um, and again, throughout this whole time, you're just continuing to gauge how much you love the process, how much you love the finished work, and how much the public loves the finished work. And by doing that, Again, when you reach the point where all three of those things are love, 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 um, then this could, in fact, be your ultimate voice. If it's not love, 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 then this is not your ultimate voice. Time to move on. So, and again, this is for those, of, again, we all spend time in process mode throughout our, our careers, even when you're first starting out, even when you're trying to learn new new concepts or you're, you're using an influence and you're trying to copy their techniques, that all is process. But I'm talking about here, this is now where you mastered the, um, the skills, the concepts and techniques. You've also had a huge exposure to painting in, in, in many, many very different ways, different mediums, different techniques. And so you now have a full tool belt now you're just trying to figure out what you're going to do with it. And so here, you're just constantly evaluating, again, which work did you most enjoy the process? Which work do you like the most? And which work do other people like the most? And this is all. This is also a portrait commission that I did in watercolor. Okay, so if you reach the point where it's, yes, you love the process, you love the finished work, the public loves the finished work. At this point, it's like, okay, focus on product mode. Now you're just continuing to create paintings like this, and you start focusing on business solutions to scale your earnings um, until right? Until one of two things happens or several things happens, you may end up doing this forever because you still love the work. The public loves the work and you love the process or what may end up happening is what happened to me. So this was what happened with me with my portraits. I started out just doing paintings of my kids. Um, and then I, re I really loved the process. I loved the product. People loved the product. People actually bought portraits of my kids, people who didn't even know me, um, actually the prize pumpkin in the top right, um, is hanging in a collector's house, but that's a painting of my son. Um, and th they did not know my son. And the one in the bottom left is a, uh, a portrait, uh, commission. But what I, st what started happening is people loved my portraits of my kids, but then they started asking me to do portraits of their family members. And, and so I started doing that and, and I was getting very busy at that and very successful. I also had been elected, uh, to the Canadian Watercolor Society on the basis of my watercolor portraits. I'd been elected to the uh, as a senior signature member of the Canadian Institute of Portrait Artists based on my watercolor and oil portraits. Um, and that was at the point where I decided it was time to quit my job as a police officer because I was going to become a full-time artist. But what ended up happening is I realized I loved the process when I was just painting, painting my kids or even painting other people in a way that I wanted to paint them that would create a great painting. I came to realize I did not enjoy it nearly so much when it was being choreographed by the client where their wishes and needs about what the finished painting was going to look, look like and how they wanted their loved ones presented. Um, and now I was painting not to create what I thought would be a great painting but I was creating a painting that I would never would have painted on my own, that I was only doing it to serve the client. And I was trying to create a painting that they would love, not a painting that I would love. Um, and I very quickly came to not only not love the process, but to hate the process of painting commission portraits. So that's when I made the decision that, okay, I am not going to 
I can't keep doing this for the rest of my life. I need to find something that I can do where I love it. And so for a certain period of time, I was doing um, some of my time doing commission portraits to still bring money in. And the rest of my time was spent in process. Um, and that's where I was trying to find, again, what is it that I love that I love to paint, where I can paint it in a way that I love the process, I love the painting, the public loves the painting, and it's done in a unique voice where it's not like anyone else's work. And that was about a two-year journey of painting portraits half the time and spending time in process. Again, when you reach the point that no, this isn't it, as will happen to me with portraits, or it may you may reach the point where, um, well, actually, this, this work will do that. So anyways, um, let me get back. So Again, if the answer is no, then you have to kind of go back and assess. Like, is is the reason this work isn't um, it? Is it because maybe there's some skills that uh, you really have kind of overlooked and need to go back and get? Um, or is it because you don't enjoy it as much? Um, again, that was me with the portraits. Or is you just don't like the concept or you don't like the subject matter or the public doesn't like the subject matter, whatever. But if the skills need improvement, it's back to practice. Um, if the skills are good and the work is good, but the public doesn't love it, then it's back to process mode until something resonates and then dig deep again. Now, you can still be spending time on selling your work. Um, and like as I said, if you've already got a develop the skills um, in the compositional sense and the techniques, the work should still be sellable to a certain degree. It's just not flying off the walls, say. And this is a good example of that. So when I when I moved away from the portraits, I was painting a lot in watercolor um, and gradually kind of over over a, a probably the course of about six or eight months came upon this style of painting in watercolor uh, where there was no pencil drawing before the painting started. It was all started just wet on wet. Um, and I had a vague idea of where the painting was going, but it was very much organic and very much kind of back and forth between me and the painting and what the paint was doing on the paper. And I loved painting in this way. And I loved these paintings. Um, the public liked these paintings. Other artists love these paintings, I should say. Actually, I, I was actually quite busy teaching courses on how I painted in this in this manner because artists loved it and it was incredibly fun to do. But people didn't love the finished work. Um, and so again, when you reach that point where it's like, and this is where a lot of artists stop too. They go, I love it. I love the process. Um, and the public kind of likes it. So I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, you will end up accumulating more and more and more and more paintings in your inventory if you do this. Because to actually earn a decent living, you pretty much want to be selling your work as fast as you're creating it. You don't want to be continually building up inventory in your collection. Um, and for these, I was actually accumulating finished paintings faster than I was selling them. Not only that, they were watercolors. So that was bad for a couple of reasons. Um, I shouldn't say bad, but less attractive than oils because first of all, I had to pay for the framing, right? It's much more expensive to frame a watercolor than to just paint the edges black on a gallery wrapped canvas. Um, I was also doing a lot of festivals. So these were much more fragile. You really had to be, if they got wet, it's like, you know, the mats got watermarked. You'd have to re take them out of the frame and remat them. If the sun hit them, they would get condensation on the back of the glass. It could run down and damage the mats. Um, the frames got dinged up because I was going from festival to festival to festival. So they'd have to be replaced. So just everything about these was not good from my uh, point of view in terms of doing the festivals with watercolors. But also clients were saying that, you know, I really love this work, but, you know, I don't like having work with glass in front of it. If it's a great big painting, it means it's really, really heavy, but it also means you have reflections. There's only limited places you can really put a painting with glass. You can't have it opposite a window, for example, because when you look at it all during the day, all you see is the reflection reflection of the window in it. So people were saying, and my galleries were saying, if you could get this work on canvas, then we think there might be something really big there that we can do. And that's so I was like, okay, back into process mode um, to see if I can get this work on canvas. Um, and lo and behold, I was able to. So this was a, I believe it was a 40 by 40 inch uh, canvas um, that was done in a combination of acrylic underpainting and then oils over top. And I loved the finished painting. And when I took it into the, my gallery, she loved the finished painting. 
I've actually had a couple um, on canvas in this style um, and she was all excited. And I told her to kind of woo back Nelly. Um, like I'm not doing this because I hated the process because in watercolor, because the, it was a very organic medium and the wet and wet, um, the way the paint reacted on the wet paper was really, really fun to do. When I moved to doing it on canvas, I just couldn't get that same enjoyment. I had to work out a way to create these paintings, which I did, but it was not enjoyable. It was like, it was just work of, of kind of coming up with the finished painting. And so it's like, I told her like, yeah, you can have these two to sell, but I'm not doing any more because I don't like the process. Guess what? Where am I? back in process mode so then i moved kind of to more traditional oils and here i wasn't even i wasn't taking any influences i was just taking kind of all the skills that i had kind of accumulated over the years and just trying to get used to painting in the water and this was in the water soluble oils just kind of getting used to painting in the water soluble oils and trying a different you know, a number of different subject matter, um, but in, in a pretty traditional, um, realistic, representational manner. Um, and then I, I just realized that, you know, I really liked the way that my watercolors were very unique and unlike anyone else's work. So it's like, OK, I, I really want to go back into now that I'm comfortable with the oils, seeing if I can kind of incorporate different ways of painting that are not just kind of like the kind of straight up traditional painting um oh and then i also i also was was kind of captivated with uh flowers in particular the light on the flowers so the, the one that's right behind my head and the one that's in the bottom left um that actually came about from i actually just had some uh, daisies sitting in a little we've got a little nook in our pantry that's kind of recessed in and the sun was hitting the flowers and going through the glass and causing these shadows on the on the back of the wall and i was just fascinated with that so i took a bunch of pictures and it's like well let me try painting that um and so then I was doing uh, florals for, for uh, a fair bit of time. Um, and I went really, really kind of far out there into collage initially. So the top two pieces are pieces where I would get paper and just kind of, um, you know, squeeze out the paint, kind of mush it up, I take it apart. And you get this amazing stuff that paint just does by itself. And then I would I would cut out um, these pieces of paper and collage them together. And so the top two were just abstracts. And then I thought, well, what if I could do the same sort of thing? But rather than using collage, what if I just masked out areas on a wooden panel and did the same thing? Kind of squeezed the paint different colors in and then mushed it and took it apart. And so that was the first piece um, that you see above that I did that above my head on the right. And then it was like, well, what if I actually use this process to actually create kind of more graphic images? So it's like I went through my books and found like an old, you know, 100 year old uh, picture of black and white picture of a saxophone player. So it's like, OK, let me take that out. I'm going to really simplify it. But then I'm going to do all this other abstract stuff behind it then with shapes. But I'm going to do it with this mushing the paint together and taking it off but it was all masked out so this is actually a painting um and again i love this piece but it was like oh it was and it, it was sort of fun but it took forever and it's like okay well okay i dug deep for a little while i'm not gonna do this i just don't think i could create enough pieces um to make this viable because it just it was just so labor intensive so kind of back to just painting and let me try just you know again every painting let me just try something with the with the canoe there it was like super super loose that was like a 30 by 40 painting that i painted in about two hours just like really really loose abstracted color um and then the other, the snow scene and the um, the birch with the yellow leaves was, again, just kind of a little painterly. And then in the bottom left, it's like, okay, let's maybe incorporate some of the stuff that I did with my watercolors in there. And then it's like, okay, let's let's go even more designy. So again, and a lot of these, I wasn't necessarily focused on one thing at a time either. I might do a floral, then I might do something like one of these. Um, and then I might have to do a portrait commission and then I might do a watercolor. So I was, I was kind of, I wasn't digging deep necessarily in one thing all the time. I was all over the map and, and sometimes, you know, coming back and revisiting things, um, 
But yeah, I was not super, super focused on any one thing. Although the landscape gradually, after about a year, I had decided it was a landscape that um, that I really wanted to focus on. And, and so I was actually approached, at the time I was president of the Canadian Watercolor Society, and I was approached by Longoy Quebec, their, their art association. So I guess Longoy and Whitby were twin cities. Um, and and Longoy is in Quebec, and where it's mainly French. And so to celebrate the twinning of the cities, they wanted to do an art exhibit in Longoy from five well-known um, um, Durham or Whitby area artists. And then we did the same thing with artists in Longueuil. So they asked me if I would, if I would submit five paintings and I was in the midst of this process mode. And I said, okay, I will, um, just so long as you know, and you're okay with the fact that all five paintings are going to be very, very different because I'm right in the midst of process. And so I'm, I'm not going to give you five paintings that are all like similar in style or subject. You're going to get five paintings that all look like they were done by a different artist and they were okay with that. So these were the ones that I sent. And these were, it was actually, these were five paintings in a row. That's, that's what I did. So that's how, how much I was kind of just kind of flitting all over the place, trying different things. Um, and actually the one on on the left the big one with the tree that was something that i did that i was very excited about that was the first time really of painting the sky behind the like painting the trees first and then painting the negative shapes of the skies um but you can also if you look closely in here you can see it like i started with like flicking paint so there's like gold reflective paint spatter flicked all in the trees and everything but it was the idea of coming in and painting the negative shapes of the sky over top of the trees i just that was one thing that i went okay i'm not going to paint like this whole way and certainly not the flicking the paint and all that underneath i really i really thought there was something there that there. So that was, that's what happens sometimes in process mode too, is there'll be a particular thing that you do when you go, Oh, I really like that. I'm going to keep that, I think, and put it in one of my, that's one of my favorite things that I want to kind of maybe um, do going forward because I loved the process and I loved the finished work. And actually it got quite a reaction, even just from my friends and family who saw it before it went to Quebec. You're always on the lookout for that kind of stuff. And so here I, um, is is where it's just starting to form what would eventually come out to be my voice you can see and again the two um the one on the bottom and the one on the top right both the trees were painted first uh they were painted on a red canvas actually all, all four of these were painted on a red canvas so there's little bits of the red showing through and also the the one on the top right and the bottom left the trees were painted first and then the sky was painted um, with negative painting um on the red canvas behind the trees and and then here you can see my styles getting a little more kind of resolved and looking like they're all kind of done by the same artist. Uh, and these actually three of these, the three square ones at this time, I was teaching quite a bit too. So I'd be teaching watercolor courses that be teaching watercolor portraits, oil portraits, all kinds of different courses. And what I would do, and on most of these, I would be away and, you know, staying over, um, you know, wherever it was at the venue for, for like three or four days for the weekend or sometimes week long classes. And what I would do in the evenings is if I had studio time, I would, and I would tell my students, hey, do you want to join me at tonight after supper? I'm going to be in the studio painting. Um, and actually the three square ones were ones that I did. Each of these were kind of one off, like two and a half hours um, start to finish. They're 24 by 24 paintings, but I would do these in the evenings while I was teaching. Um, and again, I was thinking there's something there, there. I'm, this was when I was really starting to kind of hone in on just the way of painting, like painting on the red canvas, blocking in the uh the foreground and, and and the main design in fluid acrylics and then coming over top with oils uh and then i was doing festivals and these were the first few paintings that came out where it was using that technique but with like a really strong light effect or the and in a, in a couple of them the sun shining through the trees um and i would say the one on the bottom left is the first painting i ever did where i where i could say okay that that there is a really good example of what was going to become my style. Um, and 
Um, again, I was showing all kinds of different work. Um, the festival where I showed this, it was, it was just a small festival. Um, uh, but that painting sold within like 10 minutes of the show opening. Um, and people went gaga over it. So, and I actually, the people that bought it, um, said, oh, we're going to still look around. Can we leave it here? And we'll come back and pick it up for a couple hours. And I said, sure. I could have sold it 20 times. Um, everyone that came in saw it, wanted to buy it. So that's that whole idea too, of gauging the public's reaction. And that's why I really push art festivals because it's not only the painting sold, but I also saw so many other people wanted to buy that painting. Um, and it just worked out. I love the painting. Um, when I finished the painting, I thought this might be it. This might be the thing. But I also loved creating the painting. And then when I got the feedback from the public, it's like, okay, this is now what I'm going to focus on doing. But until I did that, and at the point where that painting sold to, this is what my booth would have looked like at most of my shows when I was doing all of the art festivals, I would have examples of all of these various different different subject matter, different mediums. There'd be oils, there'd be watercolors, there'd be acrylics, um, there'd be, you know, the, the watercolors would be framed. I'd have portraits, I'd have florals, I'd have, this is what my booth would look like. Um, and I had one artist friend of mine actually ask me um, if I was mildly schizophrenic, and he was only slightly kidding, I think, but it was because every time I see a painting from you, it looks like it came from a different artist. And I said, yeah, I know. And I said, that's intentional. I'm, tr I'm trying to find who I'm going to be when I grow up. And, and I'm tasting all of these other different things that are these different possibilities in terms of subject matter, medium, ways of painting. And, and here's the thing that's really important to note about this. Actually, there's a couple things to note about this. All of these paintings, I believe, except for the one in the top right, which is of my son, Scott, which I just didn't want to let go, um, sold. So they all sold. Um, so again, that whole idea of once you've established all the skills and stuff, all of this stuff you can be creating, um, because if it starts with a great composition, even if the if the actual technique is not the greatest or the stylistic approach, you go, ah, well, that's not it. It's still probably a better painting than most of your competition out there. The th important thing to note is I got so much well-meaning advice from other artists or even from clients that said, you know, it's 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 kind of confusing when we see all of these different voices of yours and and you know i think you would do better if you just picked one of these styles and stuck with it and this was said to me many times but before that one in the center of the light coming through the forest window before that was done so whether it would be you know you should just stick with the florals or you should stick with the the kind of the collage ones or you should stick with the realism or or stick with the watercolors right pick one and stick with it because you'll you'll probably do better in terms of sales and they were right but only in terms of the short term it's like i would do better in terms of short term sales if i became known as the artist who paints these kind of collage things like the jazz player the problem was the public didn't love that some people really liked it but it was not an overwhelming oh my god i love it and nothing that i had done up until that forest window garnished that sort of a response from the public and so yes i could have picked any of these things and stuck with it and what a shame that would have been because i never would have then um, reach my own ultimate voice, which is the kind of light coming through the trees that I'm known for now, that people love, 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 and that I have trouble keeping up with the demand for and where the prices have gone very high. So that's the important thing. You will have people, if you're doing this, say, oh, you should just pick one thing and stick with it. Well, unless you, unless you have a thing where that reaction is just overwhelming, then no, do not pick one thing and stick with it. And this is also why I don't recommend um, trying to get into commercial galleries too early. Um, there are very few galleries who will let you create work like this and then hang it in their gallery. Uh, most galleries want you to pick a thing and stick with that. Um, but the problem is, again, that they're 
they're okay for you to pick a thing that, and they sell four or five paintings a year um, of your work. And, and because, you know, they need a lot of different things. They don't have all of their artists where people love, 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 love their work. Every gallery well, it's that Pareto distribution. You know, if there's 36 artists in a gallery, probably six of them are at that level where people love their work. And the sales of those six artists will equal the sales of the other 30 artists combined. You don't want to be one of the 30. You don't want to be in a gallery uh, producing work that people like and the odd person might prefer over other work they like. And so they'll pay a moderate price for it. Right. So do not be in a hurry to get into a gallery um, unless I was fortunate enough. I was in a gallery, um, gallery on the lake um, up in Buckhorn, Ontario, where the owner Actually, I got in the gallery because they were looking for a portrait artist. They wanted to have a portrait artist in their stable of artists because they occasionally got people that came in and said, oh, do you know who anyone, anyone who does portraits? So I actually started in that gallery just with my portraits. But I got to know the gallery owner very well. And she could see that I was really serious about this career as an artist. And and I was telling her about all this other work that I was doing. And so she asked to see some of it. Um, and they actually bet on me. They actually said at, at one point, um, they were like, yeah, we'll take all this stuff. And she was showing all of these varied things of mine too. Um, and, and she said, you know, we really believe her and her husband who ran the gallery that, that you're going to find something really great and it's going to do amazing. And they're like, we want to be a part of that when it happens. So just keep doing this stuff and uh, whatever you want to show here, we'll be happy to show, uh, gallery owners that, that will support you like that are very few and far between. For the most part, they want to know you're the guy that does florals or you're the one that does does the, the kind of architectural scenes of Mont Tremblant or the abstracted watercolors, whatever. And the beautiful thing about festivals is you have the ability for most of them to put whatever you want in your tent. So you can, you can do this. You can still sell your work. You can be getting the feedback um, from the people. Again, that's why I love art festivals because if you've got all of this kind of stuff, and it's all selling kind of equally and, and attracting the same kind of attention, then you know, okay, well, there's nothing here that really stands out. But like I say, the 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 one show, I can still remember the show, it was in Vineland. And I remember the couple that bought the piece because um, they actually ended up buying later on the, the piece from Lake Tahoe that's at the bottom, second from the left. And they always apologized to me when they saw me because I think this was a three foot by three foot painting. And I think they got it for $900 or something like that. And, and every time I saw them, because they would come to my open house, they would always tell me how bad they felt that they, that, they only paid me $900 for that painting. And, uh, you know, I was like, no, I really needed that $900. And not only that, that was the fact that they bought it so quick um, and then left it in the tent. And I got to see everyone else's reaction. That was the thing that convinced me that this is where I want to dig deep. And so for the next 15 years after I, so I did a show at the Toronto Art Expo, which was actually the biggest festival I'd ever done. Um, and it cost like, I think it cost about 4000 or $5,000 by the time I got my lighting and the booth and everything. Um, and that was a huge kind of risk for me because up until then, I don't think I'd done a show that was that cost more than about $400, $500. And I was doing shows where in a good show, I would do two to $6,000 in sales. Um, but I had one another gallery owner who had, had seen this new work coming out. Um, and he's like, you got to do this big show. And then I also had another friend who was uh, part of the board of the Burlington Art Center who convinced me to um, submit two paintings for their yearly fundraiser, their annual fundraiser. This would have been like in February. Um, and so, and these were just up for live auction. Uh, and I submitted two paintings that were kind of in this style and they both sold at auction for double of what I was selling them for um, at my festivals or at the galleries that I was in. So that, that really kind of reinforced that there's something there, there. So I did the Toronto Art Expo, um, like I said, I think it was about $5,000. The show opened Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. And by noon, I'd made my booth fee back. I'd done over 5,000 in sales um, in the first hour of the show. And by the end of that night, I was at 15,000 in sales. Um, and I was back and forth to my to my van because I had a whole van full of work because I was hoping that I was going to sell. And it's like, I've got replacement pieces here. Um, and by Sunday, I was at home going in the basement kind of digging out what was really B quality pieces just so I would have something in my booth. Um, but I did 28,000 in sales that weekend. 
the year before, I think I had done 28,000 in earnings total. Um, and I did 28,000 in a weekend. And that's what I mean about the world telling you the world is not shy. When you hit your voice, that's what it looks like. If that hasn't happened, do not pick something and stick with it because someone tells you, oh, this is nice, or you should stick with this. Um, again, the difference between people liking your work and absolutely loving it and having to have it is the difference between being a starving, struggling artist or being an extremely successful artist. So how long does it take to find your voice? Well, it's you do this until, um, until you find your voice. But the great thing is, again, up until the time I was doing this, I I'd had reached the point where I was getting, you know, earning twenty-five dollars to $30,000 selling the work that was kind of in process mode, all of this different stuff. Once I hit this voice, uh, my work went, I think within three years, my earnings went up to over $100,000 a year um, with me just just being in product mode and and cranking out work like this um because the prices just kept going up because the demand was going up and the galleries oh, at the end of that show that's the show where i also had 10 galleries approach me uh that wanted to show my work so i ended up picking i think i picked um two of which i'm still with coinman galleries in ottawa and eclipse gallery at uh, deerhurst resort in huntsville but i picked about three or four galleries um and i just couldn't keep up with the demand they would sell them faster than i could ship them to them so we just kept raising the prices so that three years after that show i made over a hundred thousand dollars but that was no publishing no nothing else um it, and i was still doing some festivals but it was just because the price of my work was going up and that was including that's that that's my earnings, not sales. So that's with 50% or 40% going to the galleries. Um, and me just getting about at that point, I think I made about 50 grand in gallery commissions and about 50 grand in uh, direct sales at various festivals. Or um, So again, for the last, uh, it's probably close to 20 years now, I've been mostly in product mode. But I also have had a few jaunts into process because one thing that may happen is, is after a while, you just may go, you know what, I still love this, but I'm maybe going to try something new. Uh, or I'm going to add something into the process that that isn't really there um, right now. And so I've done that several times. So let's take a look at what that looks. So the first thing was the birches. I guess for about the first 10 years that I was in this style, I did not paint any birch trees. I really didn't like, um, I tried a couple paintings with birches and I just didn't like the way they looked. They looked really car cartoony and kind of, they looked like cheap paintings that were like a cheap ripoff of a Bob Ross technique. And I see that actually a lot in the cutesy poo fall birch paintings out at art festivals and a lot of artists do and it just to me it just looks really cheap and amateurish um, and when I tried to put birch trees in my paintings they looked like that and I didn't like it so I did what I tell all you guys not to do I avoided painting birch trees uh, I avoided any scenes with birch trees in them for about 10 years and I was constantly being asked by my clients and even the galleries you know can we have something with birch trees in them and it's like nah and I tell them how I don't like my birch trees and finally I remember one client said to me he said well Packer you're you're getting to be a famous Canadian landscape painter and birches are part of our heritage so you better figure out how to paint the birch trees and I kind of went you know what he's right um so that year again when I talk about the goals my I had written down to make friends with the birch trees and I spent about a week in January um because I had to paint for a number of shows and uh, that were right up until the fall but I had actually written in my goals for the year that in January I was going to set aside some time to make friends with the birch tree well, I hope you're enjoying this so far. I'm just going to interrupt for one sec. Just want to remind you, if you're interested in looking into my courses, you can just click on the link in the description below there and it will explain all about my courses. Just a reminder, this is one module in the Creating Your Plan for Success course. Um, in that course, the other modules, I give you very specific goals and objectives and set about a plan for you depending on where you are on this kind of spectrum of skills and abilities of what you should be focusing on and what next what next what next to reach your ultimate goal of creating great work with a unique voice you also get my mastering the business of being an artist you get my color and composition course you get my birches and crimson maples you get editing digital photos for artists you'll also get one free live group zoom call with me where you'll be able to ask me any questions you have about art or the business of being an artist it's uh, this program's worth over a thousand dollars and if you click on the link below you can get access to it for 199 bucks so anyways enough said about that let's get back to the video
So I did that. I set aside the time and for about three or four days, I just was in process mode, experimenting with different ways of painting birch trees. Um, and again, I didn't just go, you know, kind of willy nilly off the top of my head. How am I going to paint birch trees? The first thing I did is I sought out influence, right? So I went looking through um, and I'd been subscribing to a number of art magazines for 15 years at that point. So I had stacks and stacks and stacks of art magazines. Um, and so I went through just kind of flicking through all of my art magazines, um, just looking for paintings with birch trees in them where I went, oh, I like the way that artist has painted the birch. Tree. Um, and then played around with different techniques just on that, um, the, the pads of canvas paper, right? Because you don't want to burn through expensive canvases, just on the canvas paper, just trying to different things until until something kind of stands out that you go oh I kind of like that and the one thing I noticed right off the bat is I really liked the birch trees where there was a lot of color I hated the birch trees that I saw in paintings where it was basically just Payne's gray mixed with white and and Mars black and that was the whole way they they painted the birch tree just various shades of gray so I thought about yeah I like the ones with color and then kind of going back to my portraits um I really really loved the whole idea of the light and reflected light in my portraits that whatever the light source was that impacted the skin tones but if like someone had a red sweater on that would there'd be the red reflected light and all of the, the places facing down, you'd get the blue of the sky hitting anything facing up and and and, and just all of the, the whole idea of the reflected light. And I thought, well, what if I did that with my birches and focused kind of on like the warm light of the sun on the side towards the sun and the cool light of the, the blue of the sky on the opposite and have it transition from um, that warm light to the cool light, but trying to interject color in there. And so I actually did some of these on the, on the canvas scratch paper. And it's like, oh, I really like that. So it's not yet time though, to jump into a painting. It's like, okay, now in process, I found something I like, a process where I liked actually creating the painting and I liked the finished result. So now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna practice it. I'm gonna do it a number of times to make sure I've got it down um, before I take this into a painting. Um, because if I take it into the painting and I haven't got it down, I'm liable to ruin the painting. So I practiced it a number of times until it's like, okay, I've got this. And then I went in and I created a painting with birch trees in it. And I think, I don't think it was, the, it might actually have been the one on the top left here. Uh, that was my first painting with birch trees. And uh, it went up to Gallery on the Lake along with a bunch of other paintings. Um, and I dropped the paintings off. And then drove home. It was about an hour and a half away. And by the time I got home, there was a message from Esther saying, we need more birch trees because that painting had sold literally the moment I left the gallery somewhere before she even had a chance to hang it. It was just sitting in the front lobby. Someone saw it and bought it. So now it's time to move into product mode. And it's like now the birch trees have become a big part of one of the motifs that have been very, very popular for me and something that I really enjoy painting. So again, that's that whole idea of even when you're you're in, in your process mode or product mode, it's like taking little jaunts into process to try different things um, that can just add to it, um, or it might be totally different which is these are my stained glass uh, type of works. And this actually came about just, it was to do a YouTube video. I want, I was talking about process on my YouTube videos and a lot of people were commenting, like, I really don't understand what you're talking about, and what that looks like. So I decided, okay, let me do a series of paintings. Uh, let me, let me kind of soiree into process mode and film it um, and, sh and then do a video kind of showing that. So what I did is I had a number of small canvases. Uh, I think these were 12 by 12s. And I just off the top of my head said like, okay, here's, here's a wild idea. Let me, let me try a painting with this approach, whatever it is. And I can't even remember what the other ones were, but the one approach that I came up with was I'm going to respond just in line to the the image that I see. And then I'm just going to abstractly fill in those areas of color. Um, and that will be a painting and that would be the painting technique. And so those two little ones you see there on the top, those were the two just kind of, you know, let's, let's just try this and see what happens. And I thought, oh, there's something there, there. 
I really liked that. Um, and these were actually, these were also based on landscape, but they were quite abstract. Um, and it's like, okay, let me dig a little deeper here. And so then we go to like the one on the bottom left again, still fairly abstract. Um, and then I actually was going away on painting trips with a group that I was part of, but it was the summertime and I hate painting the summer. I hate painting green. Um, so I decided while I was away on these trips, I'm going to do plein airs in this style. So the one in the bottom in the middle, that was a plein air that I did in this style. And then and it gradually just kept getting more and more refined until like the, my favorite of the ones that I've done of this is the one above my head. Um, and that's that's a motif that's also very popular in my kind of more known style of, of a sunrise at Lake Batiste. But this was done in that style. And I so here's where, uh, again, I actually loved the process. It was so much fun to paint this way. And I loved the finished product. Um, I really love these. And we are actually doing limited edition prints of, I think, the three pieces on the right. Um, we do limited edition prints of. Um, so the question then becomes, well, am I going to kind of totally kind of switch over? And is this my new voice? Well, we got to examine kind of an, uh, a few other things. How did the public react to it? The public really liked it. And some of the public loved it. But the reaction was not as strong as it was for my typical work that I'd been doing for the last 15 years. So uh, there's that. Then there's how long do these take me? Um, because that goes into how what's the cost for me to produce a piece like this? Well, it actually takes me two or three times as long to create a, a say, a two, 24 by 24 piece this size as it would to just create one in my typical style. So it's costing me more time to create one. Um, the public doesn't love it as much as my typical style. And to be quite honest, while I like this, after a while, I was kind of hankering to get back to my original style. So it's like, okay, so this is not it. This is something that I can do then every once in a while when I want to take a vacation from the way that I normally paint, I will allow myself to go in and create a couple of these. And it's fun. And they will sell. They won't sell as fast as my other works, um, but they will sell. It also allows me I, actually, the plein air ones that I do like this, they did all sell in rather quickly. So it means if I do want to go away on plein air trips, um, if it's the fall, I'll paint my traditional style. If it's any other time of the year, I'll paint in this style. And those I actually can do fairly quickly. I just paint quickly when it's pl plein air, you have to. Um, and, and so it was like, it was worth doing. And it's something that from time to time, I will kind of step into. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I decided I really wanted to experiment with just like my typical painting style, but just doing much, much more texture. Um, and so using a palette knife uh, rather than a brush. Uh, and so here's two examples of that. And actually the public went crazy over these. Um, the one the one right beside my head was, a, was a, I think a 40 by 40 inch. Um, and with the texture and the thick paint, it looked spectacular. And I loved doing it um, and the public loved it. So now it's just something that I do from time to time. Um, I also love, I still love painting the way that I do my typical um work that I've been known with for years. So now this apply this, this, if I just from time to time, it's like, yeah, I'm going to do one with the palette. And I've got something else to do um, where it has that same overwhelming reaction from the public. I still really love it. Um, but I don't love it all the time. I still, I still find myself whenever I kind of go into one of these other things that it's nice change. I still find myself being drawn to come back and just paint in my regular process. And so that just tells me, yeah, that's something I'm still going to keep doing. If I ever find something where I love it more, um, you'll never see another one in my typical style, which, which is, you know, again, I don't know if that will ever happen, but that's exactly what happened with portraits. Um, once I moved away from portraits, I haven't painted a portrait now in 15 years. Um, I'll be painting two this year, uh, one in oils and one in watercolor, just for my courses on painting uh, portraits in watercolor and oils. But that's, so that's what it's looked like for me in terms of that quest to find my voice. And it can seem very scary, especially if you've got something you're doing now that is doing pretty good. You know, you're you're selling a couple paintings of festival, you know, you're making, you know, maybe a thousand dollars, you know, at every festival you do or whatever, but it's like, you're not making a huge living and 
the work's not flying off the walls of your tent or your booth or the gallery faster than you can paint. Um, once you hit the thing, that is what will happen. Um, and then the only way to combat that is to keep raising your prices. But if you are not selling work faster than you can paint it, you haven't found your voice yet. And I just really, really encourage you to keep doing the work that you're selling um, and spend, because you could do like what I did. You might have a thing you do that does reasonably well. Maybe you spend 50% of your time doing that because you know it will sell at festivals, but then you spend 50% of your time in process mode. Um, and for me in the portraits, it was doing things that I had a huge audience for. I had a huge backlog of portrait commissions. So I knew when I was going to step into a commission that that was going to sell. And I also knew that if I'd wanted to for focus on being a portrait painter, I could have become very, very wealthy as a portrait painter because the public really did love that work. I just came to really resent um, spending my time doing what other people wanted me to do. So that's how I went from just being a cop who liked to paint as a hobby to uh, becoming a very successful full-time artist. And that's how I uh, eventually developed my own unique voice. And, and again, all of my success that I've experienced all of that relies on me spending that time in practice, process, and product mode to eventually find that unique voice that the public loved, where I love the process and I love the finished work as well. After doing that, I've done a lot of things kind of in business in terms of running my own gallery, um, prints and gallery representation, the online teaching, kind of all, all of the stuff I mentioned earlier. But none of that would have or could have happened if I hadn't spent the time to develop um, my own unique voice where I could create great work where the public went, oh, my God, I love it. I have to have it. And it was unlike anyone else's. So if you dream of a life as an artist uh, where you get to go into your studio every day and make a very good living from doing what you do, do not settle. Do not stop searching until you find that voice. Now, again, if you want to work with me, um, I have a number of courses in my Unstoppable Artist program um, where I'll set out an actual plan for you. You can develop a plan with specific goals and specific objectives, depending on wherever you are right now on that spectrum. And if you click on the link in the description, um, yeah, you'll be able to get that uh, huge bundle of courses at an incredible discount. And at some point down the road too, um, you may want to join my Hungry Artist community. Um, and that's where not only do you get all of my courses current and all my future courses, um, but you get weekly Zoom calls with me where I will critique members' work and answer questions and offer advice, anything about the business of being an artist. So hope you found this helpful. Um, and maybe I'll see you in the Tim Packer Art Academy down the road.